Hello and welcome back to another Feria Monthly Cup. We have the 12th edition and that means we have been going for a year with competitive Feria Monthly Cups. I am joined on the desk by Cappuccino and joined by a wonderful bunch of commentators for your games today. But Cappuccino, we didn't see you last time. How's it going, man? I am doing great. Fantastic to be back on the desk and being able to cast with you guys. This is going to be an awesome tournament and I'm excited. Yeah, we're going to see uh, quite a few new decks, I think, because the, the ladder has been developing very interestingly over the last week. Uh, Red Rush has made a comeback, Dream Reaver's being played, Red Yellow Burner's made a comeback. So it's inter most interesting to me is Red Rush. Like, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, everyone's playing Red Rush. What, what happened to Red Rush? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not really sure um, what's instigated that. Um, you know, when I was looking through the cards and seeing, like, what people might be trying to re innovate or sort of re-establish into the meta would be something like Yellow Events or um, trying to re-fine-tune uh, the Forbidden Library decks, but we've seen this resurgence of Red Rush, and I'm not really sure what caused it, but it is a, a very strong deck indeed. The, the interesting thing uh, with Red Rush going forward in, say, like a monthly cup event, we do do the Pantheon format. So with best of five, you get three decks, and your card pool is spread across all your decks. Now, Green Red Crackthorn has been a dominant presence in Feria for quite some time now. And, of course, it uses uh, very specific cards that Red Rush is going to want to use. Flame Burst, Cypher's Wrath, maybe even Grand Shakers. But... Red Rush is now starting to use Crumbling Golem and the Underground Minions to gain additional theory. So there's a lot of ways you can build it. But the question is, do you feel that players are going to drop Crackthorn for Red Rush in this meta? When I was looking through the decks that you could bring to this tournament, uh, what really shined to me was doing something like a Crackthorn list and then maybe a green-yellow sack and then a yellow event deck. Um or whether or not you go for the green-yellow sack, maybe you just go for a blue deck. But if players are seeing um, red and green as just the dominant decks at the moment, then perhaps we could see just a mono-green, a mono-red, and then perhaps that yellow events as the third deck, and that would be a very strong lineup, I think. Yeah, it's interesting how you can build your lineups uh, in this tournament. You can try to make a read on what the tournament meta is going to uh, be, and then you make, say, a counter lineup. But you... Mayhem showed us that you can bring some interesting decks and still win a tournament. He he brought Green Yellow Sack and Dream Reaver in the same lineup and won the last monthly cup. Do you feel like Dream Reaver's gotten any stronger? I've been playing a lot recently and it's been doing really well. Well, if Yellow Events isn't as popular as it was um, back in the previous month or back in the monthly I casted, um, I can imagine that with the meta slowing down, Dream Reaver would be a lot better than it was in the past. So. I think it could do very well if we don't see a lot of yellow event decks. All right, so our players are ready, and we have got a spicy match for you to start things off. We have none other than Teddy, a monthly cup champion, and he's going to be going up against a community favorite and a member of the fairy community who's been with us for a very long time and done some great work for us. And that's going to be Scream112, and one of Scorch's partners in crime. And Scorch and Shotgun are going to be bringing you the action for this first game. So, without further ado, guys, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Aquablad. I, of course, am Scorch13. And joining me for the first time in quite a while on the Monthly Cups here is Shotgun. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, yeah, it's been a long while. Uh, been busy on a lot of Saturdays. And, well, this time I was free. I was like, huh, what should I do that day? You know what? <laughs> Let me cast again, because I miss that. Uh, it's always nice when you have the time available. You even just throw the word out, and, and sometimes it works out to get you back on the cast here. Uh, we are going to ready up and just kind of get into the game as the players uh, ready up themselves when they've done selecting their decks. Uh, what are you expecting to see out of these two? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know what to expect, because this is, this is one of the best, uh, if not the best players in Feria at the moment, Teddy. Versus, well, someone who is very popular in the Feria community who has also casted a lot of monthly cups. And he's a great streamer, great guy. But I wouldn't say he is a top player. I think this is his first monthly, isn't it? 
Yeah, this is the first competitive experience for Scream. Uh, of course, as you said, casted a lot of monthly cups. At the very beginning of Faria's Early Access, put together what was the Codex Cup as well. So he's been more on that side. Uh, now participated in the qualifier number one of June, and this is his first monthly cup. And bringing out, looks like an annoying Nat deck to start with from Scream. And <laughs> we're going to see something of, uh, looks more like to be a green-yellow sack with that Village Elder in the starting hand from Teddy here. Well... It could be a green-yellow sack, um, but it could also be something different because of that time of legends. Um, not all... Well, never mind. It is a green-yellow <laughs> sack with that arid on. But I love that Scream 112 is just bringing the meme deck with the annoying net sack. And I, I can't wait. I, I'm seriously rooting for Scream, actually. So what is... For, for those that don't know, what is really the purpose of the annoying net deck? Well, there are actually two kinds of annoying net decks where this looks more like the uh, mono yellow one. Where the idea is that you try to sacrifice your nets uh, or buff, uh, buff them up using Drakars uh, and just try and get to that orb as quickly as possible with uh, Celestial Towers using the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, I've actually forgot the name of the uh, tower that buffs the attack of uh, all flying creatures. That It'd one. Be the, the Golden Aviary. Yeah, the Golden Aviary, that's it. Yeah, and so it does, does run a little bit like a yellow, just mono yellow sacrifice flying deck. Well, it's, uh, you have the... Yeah, it's uh, it has a lot of uh, flyer synergy. Uh, as you can see, it also has the Windborne Emissary, a great card for flyers. It's generally just a 5-3, and with an annoying yet on the board, it's always a 5-3. So yeah, that, that annoying it. Nat, uh, for those who maybe haven't seen it because it has fallen out of favor quite a bit uh, with the, the series of nerfs that it received kind of way back before 1.0 even hit. Um, annoying Nat is a creature that has the last words that it respawns somewhere random on the board. So you always have that flyer on, on the board to trigger your emissary here. You always have a sacrifice target if you're running something like the Demon Wranglers. Uh, so very interesting. And then because of the random positioning when it respawns, you can get it into these aggressive positions and then use the Golden Aviary to start pushing damage. Now it does deal damage to you every time. Uh, which is why we saw that Radiance in the Mulligan hand from Scream. So it'll be interesting how this plays out. Because it is a 1-1, Aridin is actually going to give Scream a lot of difficulty here. Yes, indeed. But you also got to remember that that annoying net is probably going to grow because of the Aviaries. Now, he doesn't have it in the sand yet, but there is uh, always a chance that he draws into it. And with the Celestial Tower, he can get to that orb in an instant. Now, he draws another Windborne Emissary, which is actually a really good draw at the moment because it's it's a cheap flyer, it's a sturdy flyer, and it can collect, unlike the net, which can't. Yeah, kind of unfortunate in this situation um, that Scream can't use the Celestial Tower and then have a Golden Aviary as well. That'd be a really good trade for the Nat to kill off Aridin here. Um, Celestial Tower is always an interesting one to see in these types of decks because it does give you that charge very similar to horse master but generally you would save horse master for something like a crackthorn list or maybe even a mono green if you're running that as well so celestial tower fits beautifully into this well, what he can also do is that he can actually play the command on eridan and play the celestial tower and then use celestial tower on the windborne emissary to kill off the eridan and collect at the same time yeah that looks very strong that and in this matchup the thing is that Scream with 112's deck is very aggressive, and it seems that he is playing the Celestial Tower, but will he play the Emperor's Command is the question. But this deck is very aggressive, while Teddy's deck is all about, well, it's all about throwing the Soil. Oh, he doesn't play the Emperor's Command. Um, yeah, very probably... interesting, just goes for the trade. Now, can reinforce with this other emissary, which he does, and that sets up for the follow up trade, but is really interesting in that spot that he didn't go for uh, reducing the power of Aridin to keep the other emissary alive. Yeah, indeed. Um, now, he did also draw his Radiance Imperial Airship. You only ever draw that card when, uh, whenever you have 20 health. That's just <laughs> a law, that's a hidden rule inside the card. Nobody knows why, but that's how it is. Now, Teddy gets a Deepwood Stalker, which is a great pickup, but the problem is it doesn't trade favorably with the Windborne Emissary, so he, want, he would want to 
save that up for something else or maybe wait until it gets another buff. I would think that he's going to just play the village uh, elder here. Maybe even sacrifice it to the assassin, which he is going to do. Add, oh, the buff goes on the order of <laughs> Fnatic, and that's one of the <laughs> biggest Fnatics I've ever seen. 6-5 Fnatic whenever Teddy's actually able to play it here. Uh, and, and now we can actually see how valuable Aridin was. Uh, Emperor's Command is a great card at just killing off a Shaitan Assassin here because it reduces the life to zero and kills the card even through the protection so now you have this assassin that is a 2-2 now it won't be able to kill anything off with the death touch but you still need to use two creatures to, to get through that protection so uh yes. really big in that situation of, of screen keeping the command maybe reading into something like the assassin but now it really gets punished yeah but the one thing is that um scream does have the annoying net which is a very good card against the shaitan assassin because <laughs> you don't care that the annoying net dies it comes back anyways and it's only a one one now he also gets the flash with so he can actually save up the celestial tower already pinging the shaitan assassin's shield maybe perhaps uh just in case for some other shenanigans However, use celestial tower goes to play the aviary and goes to get rid of that spirit of rebirth which i think is, the, uh, is a much better play because that Spirit of Rebirth is going to be annoying if it stays on the board. And oh my god, the Gets positioning of that annoying that. Yeah, I think that was a, definitely a very good play by Scream going for the, the Spirit of Rebirth on the far side. This assassin is going to uh, represent gaining some value for Teddy because if it's able to kill off the emissary. Um, but if Scream is able to use the annoying Nat in the right way, he's going to be able to kill that off as it is a very valuable retaliation. So going yes. for the Spirit of Rebirth first and, and really uh, um, not worrying about the Assassin, really strong play there and gets a really good uh, reposition from the Nat. Indeed. Now, uh, Teddy did pick up the Soul Eater, which is only a 5-5. Five five. That isn't that big yet, but it is going to grow a lot during this game, probably, unless uh, someone can finish it off quickly. Now, he also has a Wind Soldier, which can deal with the Emissary. Um, and the annoying yeah, Nat, it's just going to be annoying, so he could also just deep with Stalker it, I guess, but that's also not really what he would want. Yeah, a little bit of an awkward positioning here from Teddy. He does have that Fnatic or the Wind Soldier. Either of those could be really good to kill off the Emissary, um, but you'd have to use or set up a Double Prairies in order to use one of those creatures. And that means that you're moving away from getting to your Soul Eater now. Like you mentioned, Soul Eater still only a 5-5, not really as important to get it down at this stage of the game. But whenever you're running a dual color deck like this, you really want to continue to move towards all of that, uh, the land requirement for the Soul Eater. But yeah, however, that Orodrim Fnatic did ma make sure that the Shaitan Assassin could kill off the Windborne Emissary. Now... He could Scream could have actually prevented it by not moving uh, by just flying backwards one spot, I think, and the, that way that move couldn't be done. Uh, he had to use a wind, uh, wind soldier instead, which he uh, which Teddy can now save for something else. However, the annoying net can kill off the assassin and spawns in a well, not a very special spot, but because it can't kill the Fnatic just yet. It, it However, respawns with... within a jump, though. The, the Fnatic has jump and, and normally could be able to that kite is, a creature like that this is, around. That is true, and Scream does also have the Golden Aviary, which I actually missed. So he can actually play the Golden Aviary in a position to make sure that Annoying Nat will have the power to kill this Fnatic. Yeah, a little uh, unfortunate for Scream here, though. He is not uh, in as of protected position as he'd like with this aviary he does go for the second one uh not 100 percent necessary in that spot you could have saved it for more of a surprise factor on the following turn but you know in this situation teddy has the wind soldier line so he's gonna be able to clear off one of those and as soon as you're able to kill off the aviaries of your opponent you're in a much better position against this type of a deck it's just so reliant on the flying synergy that those golden aviaries play such an important factor in the rest of the game indeed and Teddy can actually now kill off one of these aviaries if he just goes double land uh, in front of his orb or from the side of his fanatic and then just jump with the fanatic and play his other aurora fanatic moving the fanatic again jumping over 
to the golden aviary. He yeah, can also just use the wind soldier, really. but he can also use the wind soldier, but that's just a waste because the wind soldier will die. And having two fanatics on the field and one being able to pressure those aviaries is just really powerful right now. And he's he is actually going for the wind soldier play to get rid of it. Yeah, a little bit of an awkward thing of using the wind soldier because, like you said, it doesn't really gain as much value as it probably could uh, because you kill off the aviary, but the wind soldier is going to die anyway. Um, in this type of a game, though, what else are you really looking at that your wind soldier is going to clear? Windborne emissaries, there's two gone already, so maybe there's only one left. You have your other wind soldiers are going to come and you're going to be able to clear those off right away. Uh, in that type of a situation, I just think that Wind Soldier still gains enough value off of killing the aviary there, especially since it collected twice as well. Well, yeah, the biggest reason why he did that was to get close to a Soul Eater, because next turn he can actually bring out the Soul Eater, which is going to be very devastating for Scream, as the, as I said in the beginning of this matchup, Scream has to be aggressive. The problem is he can't, he hasn't even hit the orb yet, and he has to put up the pressure right now to even stand a chance because the longer the game goes the more the soul eater will grow and the more scream will be in a will have an issue with it dealing with it yeah and a little bit of this deck uh, from Scream, the the Nats, because they deal damage to yourself, you are working towards that discounted cost of Radiance, and maybe using that as a win condition as well, uh, eventually getting that big swing of a giant 10-10 body on board and the life heal. But a lot of time, the Soul Eater decks get to a point with a single Soul Eater where they can still hit you for... 15 to 20 even 20 plus damage so it really doesn't matter what your orb total is at if, if the deck has no way to deal with that solier or doesn't get aggressive before that solier can come down scream is really going to struggle to close out this game indeed and uh, with the soul eating rate the scream stack only uh, runs one radiance because it's a legendary Steady has three soul eaters in the stack so even if uh, scream manages to deal with the first soul eater that will be a second and perhaps even a third. And at that point, it's basically game over because those soul eaters will be so bare, so big, that Scream won't have the resources to even deal with it. I'm not even yeah. sure that he actually runs uh, Last Nightmare in his deck, uh, seeing as he only runs two deserts right now. And I don't think he even has the room for Last Nightmares. Yeah, it's always an awkward situation when you're running something like this and you have that two deserts down and you're drawing looking for answers. But if you draw into a Last Nightmare, you need the extra desert. So you always end up in awkward spots in, in that type of situation. But uh, another good clear there by Teddy. Again, just biding his time. He's going to win through a Soul Eater. That is the win condition of the deck. So as long as you can clear off whatever your opponent has and, and slow down that aggression, you can really always play towards that end game. Indeed, and uh, now Screams is at 12 health, um, which isn't actually that low for this deck. It can get low very quickly. Uh, however, the thing is that Teddy's deck doesn't do chip damage, so Screams' life total doesn't really matter. In the end, he is going to finish it off with a gigantic Soul Eater, and at that point, any healing that Scream does won't even matter. Now, he did pick up an eye on a smile, but gets his Kaleem and another em his final emissary. Not sure that those two will do that much uh, right now at this point in the game. There is a really good play here if Scream goes for a desert now, because he had the charge of the Demon Wrangler. If he position plays a desert down, maybe he can get uh, the Emissary down in a really good aggressive spot, and then you force your opponent to deal with that. I don't think you go for Kaleem in this situation just because it does get cleared by the Fnatic, but the Emissary represents a big chunk of either clearing off the Fnatic or damage to your opponent's orb. So I definitely would like to see the desert before, but Scream doesn't go for yeah, it. He, he doesn't go resets for it. with Kaleem here. Yeah, I would have loved the uh, desert as well, but uh, I do believe that he actually did draw that turn already. What did he go for Feria? Uh, yeah. No, he did. He, he actually uh, already draws, so he couldn't even play the desert right there. Yeah, a little bit of an odd turn there. 
Um, so what is the follow-up from Teddy here then? Sitting on four Feria, not enough lands to, to go for a, something like a plus one into the Soul Eater. Unfortunately, got a Therian Golem off of the Bloom Sprite. So that's really never a oh. card that you get to in, in this type of a deck. Teddy, but... Teddy is go just going to be very defensive, uh, playing very defensive right now. That net can't kill any of his creatures on its own right now. Um, it can potentially kill the uh, Spirit of Rebirth with the Emperor's Command. So he's got that going for him, but that is still costly, and that's another heal gone. Although, again, as I said, the heal won't even matter that much in this matchup. But he can still actually dive through his gnats. So Teddy won't even need to play the Soul Lead anymore. And that's all it's already a 10 10. It can already kill a Radiance. <laughs> yeah, looking like a very good position for Teddy, un unless Scream is able to uh, find some aggression and, and kind of win the game within the next few turns here. Uh, now, Kaleem does represent a, a pretty decent line of using the Flashwind, maybe the Emperor's Command, to kill off the Fnatic. And then you can use your Celestial Tower and start pushing some orb damage with the Gnat, even develop an aggressive desert like we were talking about. Um, Sword, Sword Rain is Rain. a great pickup. That's just what he needs, because now, right now, he can kill the guy, he can rush with his Kalim, grab another Feria, and he can just hit that orb. Yeah, clears or, off the Spirit of Rebirth as well, of Rebirth, but... Which is actually better, because right now, Teddy, Teddy right now is actually in a tough position, because he doesn't have that much Feria. He has a lot of big creatures, but to turn that you play those big creatures, they don't do anything. Yeah, that was such a big draw for for Scream there, just because the follow-up of the play that I was outlining didn't have a way to kill off the Spirit of Rebirth. And the way that it ended up playing out, uh, Scream was just put in such a good position to kill that off. Oh, and he draws the last Nightmare the moment that, uh, that Teddy plays his Soul Eater. That is just a killer top deck. So he did run the last Nightmares. Now, he can actually cast it by playing the Desert, Using Celestial Tower on the Windborn Emissary to collect. And just hit in with the uh, Kalim. Uh, actually, he can just hit in with the Kalim and spawn his uh, little follower and collect. I, I think you still use the Celestial Tower here because that puts your Windborn Emissary in a position where you can probably push some more orb damage next turn. Uh, you're going to be able to use that follower to block off Teddy's... Uh forest in the bottom corner there and then you can move maneuver around with your creatures to really push the most damage next turn and now, looks like it's even going to be just a two turn lethal setup yeah teddy is in a lot of trouble and yeah it's only on free fairy i don't think he can actually do anything with this deck and kaleem uh, drawn and that's going to be the game play, scream that's... taking game one <laughs> wow wow <laughs> who does the stream like he it was looking bad for him at one point, but then the with it just started uh, to turn around with that one sword drain uh, top deck, and after that, yeah, that the last nightmare. That was amazing. Incredible sequence of draws. Now, to be fair, Scream had been drawing pretty much the entire game. Uh, just developed those two early deserts, and because everything that you're playing has flying, you don't need to develop more lands to get your creatures into the right positions. So Scream had drawn through more than half the deck, I, th I think, at the end of the game there. So drawing into those cards should be really high percentages and, and just incredible top decks to find them exactly in the situations that he needed it. Yeah. Uh, so what would you expect to see from Teddy as the response here? I would here? expect something that can deal with those nets. Uh, something like red that can just deal constant full damage, uh, kill those nets constantly. And yeah, we see a red rush right here. Now, Gift of Steel, not the best first guy. He gets it back oh. though. The Mulligan system right now. Yeah, a little bit of an awkward start here for Teddy then. Uh, Outland Ranger is always really nice because you can start developing prairies and get that early collector uh, on turn one rather than going for something like Mountain and then Mountain and then playing the creature on turn two. So uh, that'll allow Teddy to get just a creature down, but then you really want to set up for your next follow-up. And, and if this does have any sort of burn 
uh, mechanics coming out, even just in, in the Cypher's Wrath setups, uh, onto Annoying Gnats is double the damage to your opponent. So uh, Teddy should be in a good position with this counter deck, but just an awkward start for him here with these creatures. Yeah, now he can do a very quick start because both of these creatures are neutral, so he can just play the Outland Ranger on turn one to start collecting. And unless Scream gets a Soul Drain, that Outland Ranger is just going to collect. Now he could also uh, go for the campfire play on the uh, ranger, which we see here, so he can't get soul drained. Some precautionary uh, stuff here. And yeah, something that we actually see quite a bit, whether uh, it's against yellow or whether it's against red because of that Cypher's Wrath. Like I mentioned the Soul Drain, like you just mentioned, uh, playing the campfire on the Outland Ranger just almost guarantees that it's going to survive for an extra turn. Yeah, now Scream does have the uh, Iona's, uh, Iona smile to grab some more flyers, which I would see him put down. Maybe he even plays the Annoying Net instead, or maybe even both. But I would actually just start with the Iona smile. There's not much else that you can play here. And that way you also thin out your deck to get those soul drains, to get your removal. It, it's a bit of a difficult spot here because if you go for smile then you know maybe you draw another gnat and you can combo into something next turn but if scream chooses not to play those because the annoying gnats can't collect uh he's in a position where then next turn he might not have the fairy necessary to go for something like the celestial tower golden aviary play and clear off the outland ranger and, and start getting the value out of those gnats so looks like he's gonna hold off for now and maybe go for a clear play next turn well, what he also could have done is play the Ariona Smile, um, play the net, and then next turn go for an extra Feria and still do the combo because he doesn't require that many lands. However, he does top deck the Windborne Emissary, which is actually a really good top deck uh, against that underground boss, which is just value town generally, but that Windborne Emissary can just trade with it. Now, Scream does have to be careful that this underground boss doesn't kill his net because that is a lot of fairy again for Teddy there. <laughs> yeah, it will be a lot of uh, fairy recovery if you're able to get a lot of value out of the underground cards. Uh, Wimborne Emissary does set up a really good answer against the boss uh, because you'll always have the gnat on the board like we talked about in, in the first game. Uh, Wimborne Emissary will be that 5-3 and then if you play the aviary as well, it'll be a 7-3. Now, However, unfortunately, the, the Gift of Steel gift coming of out steel. from Teddy, yes. Indeed, even a Golden Aviary is not enough to one-shot this underground boss with the uh, with the Golden Aviary and win one Emissary. And we can also see a Gift of, uh, next to the Gift of Steel, there's also a Silent Horse Master. Which... Oh, that's interesting. So he's going to trade with the Outend Ranger right now. And he's... He has yeah, to play the Golden Aviary here. I'd really like to see Scream develop lands to the far side and put that Golden Aviary in a more protected position and play around a Horse Master instead of uh, playing right into it. Unless yeah, he goes this for is a very desert. Dangerous. This, is, this is actually very dangerous play for him because yeah. now Teddy just needs a Silent Horse Master, which he has, double land, and that's two free fairy up. Yeah, this is just incredible right now. The combat of... Uh, these cards does trigger off of structures as well. So Teddy is going to gain there, able to clear off the Golden Aviary, put himself in a really good position here. Um, Wimborne Emissary can come down, but Scream's follow-up is really lacking that extra power. Yeah, now he can play a Desert uh, next to the uh, Celestial Tower on the other side to play his Windborne Emissary, but he's just going to go aggressive with this in Windborne Emissary, hoping it can kill the underground boss. But as we've already established, there is a Gift of Steel in his uh, in Teddy's hand, which will just deal with this Windborne Emissary neatly. And this Nat, well, it just might as well just start poking that orb, because it's in a position where it can't do anything else, really. That was a position that it almost looked like Scream could have switched to a bit aggressive. Uh, use the Celestial Tower, move the Gnat far across onto the mountain in the, the bottom right corner there, and place a Desert instead of going for the draw, and play the Wimborne Emissary in an aggressive spot instead of in a defensive spot. Now that immediately gets cleared by the Horse Master, but playing around the Underground Boss may have been something he could have gone for there. Indeed, and well, we see it, the Gnat, Annoying Gnat, just going to do an Annoying Poke. 
and Teddy probably doesn't care at this point. It's only one damage, and there's a ground shaker. Heck, uh, Teddy can actually just play an aggressive ground shaker, Cyphus Wrath the uh, Windborne Emissary, and then hopefully hit the uh, Celestial Tower with the underground boss if the net doesn't go into an annoying position. However, he opts for just going for the trade there and keeps yeah. the uh, ground shaker for maybe perhaps another annoying net. And that's going to uh, be a lot of a lot of damage to the orb. Plus, the underground boss is now threatening the orb with, yeah, not just, I, with six damage and a free to ferry again. I think I still would have liked to have seen the ground shaker there if it's something that you're saving for more nat value of, of the burn of killing those off. I understand that. But in that situation, Teddy could have established the five attack of the ground shaker in the position where the underground boss is killed off the celestial tower and had the boss in an aggressive position just to follow up with the uh, gift of steel next turn anyway so uh, i think that was possibly just less damage coming out from teddy over the course of the next turn or two yeah but i think teddy just wants to save that ground shaker for it to kill more than just uh one one creature basically and right now He's going to get way more value because he was so patient with the Ground Shaker as he can play next turn. He can play his Ground Shaker, kill off not just Nat, but also Demon Wrangler, and then Cyphus Wrath the Demon Wing. <laughs> and scream with the error <laughs> emote coming out. Uh, yeah, this just looks really good oh, now and because he did burst. save it. Well, the Ooh. Flame Burst doesn't do much right now, but later on it can get rid of a uh, Windborne Amnesty easily, or just finish off the game. And I am I would be surprised if we didn't see the ground shake here. It's just too good right now. That yeah, Teddy sadly, going for the draw the ground... of... oh, Go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm just... Uh, Teddy going for the draw instead of putting another mountain down for a more of an aggressive oh, ground shaker got... line. Oh, he's got it with the <laughs> I didn't actually host that. That was very good. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about removal and, well, Teddy, here's a moth uh, magician. He knew exactly how much damage he could do in 10 seconds and went for it for the lethal. Wow, that wow. is, uh, I mean, kind of what we mentioned off the, the start of that game was the double dipping on the burn damage there. Uh, when you're able to kill the gnats off, they deal the damage themselves naturally to your opponent. And if you're able to use Cypher's Wrath, that deals double the damage. Uh, Ground Shaker is able to kill them off and deal that one extra. And, and Teddy with a really nice line finding the way through to get that flame burst for the extra damage for the lethal there. Yeah. Now, what do you expect uh, Teddy to or Scream to pick as a deck against this red rush uh red typically struggles against something like green when you're just able to put out bigger creatures than they're ever able to deal with so if scream is running one of those in his lineup i definitely be expecting to see something in the green uh maybe even blue because it has the extra movement you can take trades on your terms instead of allowing the red player to take trades on their terms but it really depends on what his lineup is, but I'd kind of be leaning more towards the mono green, kind of if I know Scream type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if I know Scream, he would probably just go for the meme decks, for the fair decks that he thinks are fun to play. Uh, green green would be a good uh, pick up here because uh, those big creatures just generally can survive the red onslaught, and it's generally a very aggressive, uh, very defensive deck that can turn aggressive in an instant with those uh te with the teleports and well we're still waiting on the players to select their decks yeah i, I think it was a really nice response from teddy of course just the red does get so much value from killing off the gnats every time uh red combat like that type of a deck you're able to have the underground cards in there you're able to have your aoe clears uh I think should be a really good deck for the course of the tournament. Uh, depending on the way that your lineup ends up uh, matching up into your opponent, you can get, I think, good value off of facing off of yellow, facing off of blue. It really depends on what the cards are that kind of come in those orders, but I, I think this is a really nice deck to see coming out from Teddy here. Oh yeah, no, Red, Ru Red Rush has may, uh, made a resurgence lately. It's just a very powerful deck. Uh, it can put up so much pressure, has great removal, and well, Scream does have degree, and 
not the best starting hand. He is going to redraw all three, and that oh. is a little bit better because of the Skami Warrior, but the Elderwood Embrace and Poison Crew so early on, not really what you're hoping for. Voice of Truth can gain a lot of value against this type of a deck. Uh, it depends on the way that your opponent reacts to whatever you play. If they think you're setting up a Grove Caller play and they preemptively Gift of Steel, and then you set up a Voice of Truth, you deny that value from your opponent. Something like Cypher that we see in Teddy's opening hand, if it starts snowballing out of control, maybe you're able to set up Voice of Truth to reduce the power that it has. So could be something that's very important in the early game, but we don't see those cards coming out from Teddy. We see the Axe Grinders, Cypher maybe get some value but i don't realistically see that in a, a green matchup uh, and scream with the really nice sagami warrior start uh, if teddy does get aggressive he's going to be able to use that elder with embrace as well so uh really good early creatures coming out from both players yeah now teddy also gets the gift of steel not that good right now because he has no combat creatures in his hand but um he's just going for aggressive lands save up his uh, Feria and X Grinder. I don't see expect Cypher to come out anytime soon because uh, Teddy Teddy knows well that what Green can do with their buffs. And Scream actually picking up a Wood Elemental, which is a great pickup because now he can just go forest, uh, he can just go double forest and make sure that Teddy can, can't get that gr X Grinder spot. Yeah, that's a really good pick up there. Uh, Scream could have gone just four double prairies to ensure that he denies those positions, but when you're able to continue to develop your forests as fast as possible towards your Thearian Golems like we saw in his mulligan, towards your better positions for Grove Caller, uh, it just lines up so nicely when you're able to find these early wood elementals. Indeed, Scream, like Green is more dependent on getting those special lands out because of those Thearian Golems, and Red has a really, really difficult time dealing with those Thearian Golems, so... It is kind of a win condition for him. Yeah, so efficient in this matchup uh, when you're able to put down a 5 cost 510. It oh, really is insane. Scream opts to not go for the double for our forest and just goes for the Elderwood Embrace to make sure that the Skami Warrior uh, trades favorably with the Axe Grinder. Now, it is a very safe play, uh, safe play because if uh, Teddy has the Horse Master, he can just Horse Master, have a, another collector, and just have a free for free trade, basically. However, right now, it it says Teddy has the opportunity to secure that spot now uh, if he goes double prairie. Now that does delay a lot of his stuff, uh, but uh, so he's probably not going for it. He's, we're probably going to see something else. I don't expect the Cypher unless he plays the Cypher with the Gift of Steel. Wow. Oh, Basically giving away Cypher for free, it looks like here. Well, you would say that, but <laughs> there. Scream doesn't have the other buff. Yes, so that is very true. Cypher. However, he can trade with the X Grinder, but if he trades with the X Grinder, then the Cypher will just eat that Skami Warrior and gets that 4 health back and becomes an 8 7. Yeah, it's just kind of awkward positioning from Scream here. Doesn't have a good follow-up. Uh, doesn't have anything to Voice of Truth right now, and can't both play a Forest and gain one Fairy to play that Grove Guardian. So uh, probably we see him just move the Sagami Warrior back a space and just wait until next turn. But it's just really awkward positioning because he doesn't have a good follow-up right now. Indeed, uh, this is a very awkward spot. Um, he ha does have to play that Forest next to as well because... If he doesn't, those X grinders, uh, other two X grinders that will come out, will just be value town, and it's just a horrible spot to to have a red player between those two wells to get a fairy out because red kind of needs the wants that fairy out. Yeah, it is very reliant on having that extra Feria uh, gain throughout the course of the game. We saw the Underground Boss come out last game. That's five Feria. We saw the Ground Shakers. That's six. So if you're able to really cut off the Feria gathering of these red decks early, they very, very much struggle to get back in the game. Now Teddy does indeed go for the Forest there and just passes the turn. There's not much else he can do. And Teddy now can just start collecting... He can, well, I don't know uh, what else he can actually play because uh, because of that five eight. That five eight is still can say, is still very deadly if 
Scream gets that other uh, buff. But Teddy knows that Scream right now doesn't have the buff in his hand. So he also knows that Scream has to top deck it, which is a low chance. So he is going to be very aggressive here. Just play the X grinder, just put up pressure. And there he is, the buff, the savior. <laughs> This is so good of a pickup here from Scream. Has the Faria now to Elderwood Embrace, kill off Cypher, and play Grove Guardian if he wants to, right in between the Axe Grinders. That'll trade really nicely. Uh, one of the things that Red can do in this type of matchup against Green is exactly what Teddy is doing. Flood the board with creatures because you know Green doesn't have any AoE. You can possibly take trades in the right way, but we see Scream just has the ability to counter that in this situation. Yeah, and Scream getting close to those 5 4s, so soon enough he'll be able to play those Fyrian Golems. And even the 5 6 and the 7 7 are just very hard for Red to deal with. And now we do see in, a, in Teddy's hand that he can actually kill those creatures, but that will be pretty costly. That will require him to spend a Gift of Steel, Cypher's Rob. Um, I would I... expect him to do the, to do the or play the Garadan. Garadan is a massive swing here for Teddy. He's able to kill off both of the biggest creatures right now and have a 6-6, six, six, which looks really strong against the just 3-1 of yeah, Scream. Yeah, but there comes the Furian Golem, which can just deal with this Garadan. I would expect him to just create... Oh, wait, he does have the Faria for it. Yeah. That really is, this is very there. awkward. Is there a play that you can go for to set that up next turn, use the Voice of Truth... I just think Voice of Truth to heal there isn't enough. Well, what what Elemental comes out from Scream, going for the draw instead of either the plus one Faria or the um, forest development to get towards that Therian Golem next turn. And I guess both Wood Elementals represent killing off Garadin, but yeah, it just I looks like your opponent should have something to deal with the 3-1. Yeah, no, he is going for this because the Wood Elemental does grant the fifth forest for the Furian Golem. Um, and next turn, he can actually play the Furian Golem because one of his Wood Elementals might survive. Though, as we can see, that won't be the case because of the Cypher Drop. And yeah, Teddy is just going to put on the pressure. Scream has almost no Feria. He does get a Living Willow, but without a Feed the Forest, that Living Willow doesn't do that much. Yeah, I was going to say, Living Willow is a very big pickup because if you can draw into that Feed the Forest, it's a big Feria swing, but uh, you're just not able to have both the draw and the extra Feria to Feed the Forest on this turn if he draws it. So uh, looking possibly towards a Therian Golem next turn then, but now just so far behind. Uh, in the same way that I was talking about Red struggling to get back in the game if you're able to cut off their Fairy Collection, because Scream was very limited to just the one well in the top right corner, he now isn't able to play anything uh, because he's very starved on Faria. Indeed, and Teddy has not just the Garena, but Garena also has Charge too, so it can, it can go places. And with that Outland Rager in such an aggressive position, Teddy can just decide to step up, create a land, and play a creature in front of the orb, which would be very devastating for Scream, because right now he does have the defensive capabilities. Even the Living Willow won't be enough. Yeah, Living Willow does survive to a lot of things, but it really isn't going to clear anything at all. Scream gonna go, looks like, for a full reset and just ensure that he has a creature collecting onto the far side of the board there. Uh, now Underground Brigand picked up. Uh, looks really strong for Teddy to play that and then combo into Gift of Steels. It just depends if he can put it in a protected enough position, if he's worried about a, a buff coming onto this Living Willow and, and killing the Brigand before he can get those Gift of Steels down. Yeah, I would expect a just an aggressive underground brigand in front of the orb. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, the brigand doesn't really care about the living willow because he can just also just hit into the living willow, gain that feria, and play other big stuff like that ground shaker that he has in his hands. And that is exactly what he's going to do. He's even going to campfire it. Very just nice. To make sure to, uh, that it survives a buff, and there is the buff that would have one shotted it. So great foresight from Teddy. Oh, so funny the way it works out sometimes uh, of these players, you know, playing around the possible outs that your opponent can has, uh, can have in those situations, 
and then you just see the the perfect top deck and the, they're just played around it so beautifully yeah. so really heads up play there from teddy to have uh kind of the foresight like you were mentioning to go for that campfire uh leave scream in a pretty awkward positioning just because you don't really want to voice of truth because then you can't follow up with the buff and get that clear uh, it's i guess just move over and collect with the living willow here and yeah take the brunt of he, this damage yeah but if he does that then not only does he get the brunt of the damage and as we can see with the gift of steals that's going to be a lot of damage but teddy will also gain two extra fairy to spend and he is already in a double collecting position and scream just can't afford that really rough going for the draw and finding something else that you can't play in that situation um possibly there if scream had drawn a feed the forest maybe you just feed the living willow and play Therian golems down instead but even goes for the attack instead of trying to leave this living willow as healthy as possible and this is just really going to be game here teddy can go for the gift of steals that's going to allow him to kill off the living willow and then scream just has no way to defend against next turn lethal yeah, there is no way for Scream to make a comeback. Maybe perhaps if he top decks another Living Willow with a Feed the Forest and... I don't know. He can delay it, but even then he can just delay it. And he says, well played equals true. And indeed it is. So we'll probably see the Surrender just here. Yeah, that looks like it. what it's going to be. Uh, whether Scream goes for the Surrender or lets Teddy actually get the lethal hits in, it just is game in this... Oh, actually, oh, the voice just... of truth does delay it. I, I mean, it doesn't no, but he really. Still, <laughs> he still knows that he is in an almost in an incredibly hard spot to win this or to make a comeback. So he just decides to. Hey, we we both uh, are on time. We don't. I don't want to delay it. Let's just go to the last match. Yeah, really nicely played from Teddy. There got a lot of value out of Garrodin uh, in the clear in between the wells and then just able to out collect scream over the course of the game he was never able to come back if scream had able been able to take those couple early trades in a way that favored him and he was it then able to combo that collection into theory and golems there would have been no way for teddy to catch up in that situation so just really big in that spot teddy had the aoe got so much value out of those early trades and able to snowball that into taking the game Indeed. Now, what do you expect for Scream to have as his final deck? Would it be a meme deck again? So we saw yellow gnats and we saw mono green. So that leaves you with red and blue. So is Scream going to bring, like you said, the, the meme maybe of a blue red bargain deck? Or will it I be something so, of... I know he was playing the red rush, red mid-range style um, on ladder... I think it was last month to get to God rank, but seeing the underground bosses, it looks like it'll be basically a mirror match here of red combat. Well, it could be the red combat deck, or it could be actually a more mid-range controlly style of a red deck. I have seen that. I have actually played that deck. It also works very well. It's less aggressive than the red rush style, but still, it can. It's way. It's way more controlly using bomb slingers and making sure that your opponent just doesn't have creatures. Yeah, very true. If you're able to have all of these constant clear tools, and then you just, you know, don't ever let your opponent do anything. Uh, we do see Teddy again with these Axe Grinder starts. He's actually going to play away from Scream this game. Triple boss picked up now. Actually, it looks like Teddy makes the right decision because these underground bosses would have picked up a lot of value against Axe Grinders. Indeed, and we are going to see one of those underground bosses uh, coming down because the Ground Shaker here doesn't do anything. It deals one, it deals one orb damage and one damage to that Axe Grinder, but he has no other card to pick off that Axe Grinder next turn yet. So we're probably just going to see the underground boss. Now, is Scream going to build towards Teddy? Or is he just going to continue his way towards the fairy well? He decides to go for the fairy well and place the uh, underground box next to it. Yeah, I think I like this. Uh, of course, you've already started developing that way and then your opponent went away, so you do have that decision. But 
at least getting the boss down here, it's a very healthy creature against the AoE that your opponent possibly can have. Uh, you don't necessarily mind if it just sits and collects in the top right corner for all of the game. If you're able to have your creatures then combo into something good on the left side and, and defend against whatever your opponent's doing. Uh, looks like Scream is actually just going to continue to push up the right side saying, you want to go that way? Fine, I'm going to go this way and I, I think I can win the race. Yeah, and next turn we do see in Scream's hand that he has the Ground Shakers and this time with the Cypher's Wrath so he can deal with at least the bottom axe grinder. Uh, I would expect Teddy to just go explore the mountain and play another aggressive axe grinder or maybe even an underground boss. If, he, if Teddy goes on the defensive then he'll probably be in a, in a losing spot in this game. As yeah, Red, I, you want to be the aggressor. I think the Axe Rider generally you save for an interior position, especially in this situation where it looks like you're going to get that inside well positioning for a mountain. Getting the Axe Grinder at 5 damage to the orb the turn after you play it, instead of this situation where it would be a movement or two away, your opponent maybe is able to clear it before you're really able to do anything. And the underground boss just represents being so much healthier on the board so Indeed. um does go for that i would def definitely expect like you mentioned last turn uh, ground shaker into cypher's wrath to clear off the axe grinder from teddy in the bottom left corner and then that puts your uh, your ground shaker in a really good position yeah this is uh, at this uh, moment scream will have the double collect and teddy teddy doesn't he only gets one fairy each turn However, Teddy is in a very aggressive spot still, and he can even get a mountain down to maybe play an aggressive axe grinder. That ground shaker is also pretty aggressive, but the problem is that it's still two spots away from that orb, so that this turn he can't or next turn he can't really do anything yet with it. Another axe grinder picked up here for Teddy, so even if one of them gets cleared, he's going to be able to reinforce with another. Really strong positioning here. Uh, is that little step ahead because his underground boss is looking to threaten some damage next turn instead of Screams, which is sitting up in, in the top right corner here. So Ooh, Flame Spitter, that, now that is a card that you generally don't see being run in these decks because it's it doesn't do enough. However... If uh, Scream manages to get a Flame Burst off the top of his deck, then he can actually just kill off that, this underground boss. Uh, Flame Spitter is actually really interesting in here because we've already seen the one damage come out from the Ground Shaker, reducing uh, Teddy's underground boss to a 3-4. Axe Grinder sits in the same way. It's got the 4 life. So underground boss uh, of Scream sitting up in the top right corner, attacking into either of those creatures. Flame Spitter is going to be the one extra damage needed to clear those off. So really interesting to put those in there. Scream obviously making a read of, I need one extra damage in a lot of situations. So Indeed. Now... Where I think he is actually going to decide to just play another underground boss instead of moving the other uh, underground boss. This way he can, he still has that fairy collection and he, he can just easily deal with this underground boss if it hits into your orb. However, we can also see that Teddy actually has two flame bursts in hand so he can just nuke away one of these underground bosses, hit the orb with his underground boss gain a bunch of extra feria, move up his undergrad, his uh, X grinder, and then just play another X grinder. It's interesting in that situation that Scream went for the underground boss, uh, the second underground boss. Again, because they have the combat, they recover that feria. Maybe you can find something good to play as a follow-up of some like AOE if, if that's what you need. But if Scream had held that boss instead of playing it because he already had the one, he could have kind of baited your opponent and maybe make Teddy think twice before really flooding the board if he's going to go for the Outland Ranger, if he's going to play the second Axe Grinder as well. So it's a situation where you could have held a card to make your opponent wonder if their play is correct. Because if Scream right now is sitting on six Faria instead of what now is six Faria, it would have been 12 this turn. And you make your opponent think, does he have you know, fi uh, Firestorm into Ground Shaker? Does he have Garden and something else? Do I play this Axe Grinder in that position or should I wait for something uh, like a better position in there? So really interesting that Scream went for that. Is going to uh, be able to clear off the underground boss of Teddy here, but I 
think it was just a situation where you could have almost baited your opponent into wondering if you had that AoE. Indeed. Now, of course, Creep doesn't have the AoE, but he does have the Flame Spitter, and Teddy is in for quite a surprise when he sees, come, sees it coming down. He is just going to clear this underground boss. He kind of has to. That underground boss is just generating value for Teddy. Teddy, however, is on 9 Feria. Next turn, he's on 12, 13, 14 Feria, which is a lot. He can do a lot of stuff. He can even just play his uh, play a Garudan if he wants. Yeah, Scream's going to have to be not necessarily careful here of that AoE, but like you said, your opponent has a ton of Feria, so you need to know that that is a possibility. But I don't think he can really play around it. You need that Flame Spare to come down to kill off the underground boss. You need your Axe Grinder in an aggressive position so that you can keep up with the race of your opponent's Axe Grinders. Uh, so it just has to be all these creatures down onto the board. And it's interesting in this spot, because Teddy already has the double flame burst, he just has to get his opponent down low enough that maybe the third one gets picked up and you're able to finish the game through those, whereas Scream has none in hand. So he really needs both of these creatures in, in the bottom right corner to carry the game. Yeah, however, as you can see, the Teddy might uh, save his flame burst, but he could also just opt in to actually play one of these flame bursts to kill off a kill off maybe the axe grinder to get it with the using by also using the ground shaker maybe even putting the ground shaker in a more defensive spot uh, so that he can kill off the other ground shaker next turn and just put up pressure using his um, axe grinders the ground shaker looks like we are going to see that come down. It is going uh, to be aggressive, though, uh, which I actually like. Uh, this puts up more pressure, and it is it is basically turning into a race right now. And Teddy also has that other campfire, and that axe grinder is going to hit even harder than that ground shaker. Yeah, this does set and up a next turn lethal right now. Scream's going to have to draw into... <sighs> What, what do you need in this situation? Maybe a Firestorm does it, but you really need to kill off Ground Shaker and, and you just don't have the ability to do it Yeah, he, need, he needs a Firestorm. He actually does need a Firestorm in order to, uh, to uh, kill at least two of these creatures and have a sort of chance to survive. Uh, actually, a Firestorm would actually be great if Teddy doesn't pick up the finishing... Maybe another flame burst or a another cypher drop because that would be enough. The only other way I see to do it would be to kill off, I guess, one of either the axe grinder or a ground shaker. Would I guess you would probably kill off kill off the axe grinder with both of the underground bosses here, and then you a develop Garadon a mountain would also directly be in front. That's true. Garadin would be enough as well. Um, now that's if Scream wants to rely oh, he on the it. top decks. Oh, Scream, the top deck master. That's exactly what he needs. He's probably going to just play the Garadin aggressively. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. And now Teddy has to hope for his own Cypher Swap. It's got to be a Wrath. Yeah. Um, I was going to say in that situation, if Scream didn't want to just rely on the top decks... Oh, uh, <laughs> of is not enough. He's one fairy short. If he top decked the gift of steel instead of the underground boss, that would have been enough. But sadly, it isn't. And well, yeah, this that's going to be game four. Scream evening up the series two to two. <laughs> Whoever uh, expects Scream to do so well against Teddy? Unreal with the top deck again. Garadin finds his way through, and just like in game number three, we saw how good Garadin was for Teddy. Scream swings that right back and says, hey, I can do you one better for the game, top decks Garadin. I am happy that we chose this match uh, to be the first game because this these games are amazing already. This is going to be a very good month. I can already tell you that. And we go into game number five. Teddy bringing out. Uh, I would I would expect something blue to, to come here. We've seen the green yellow sack. We've seen the red combat control. And now we see looks to be a blue sevens. Uh, seeing those archons come down, we'll have to see if it's more of the control heavy or if it is more of the uh, dream reaver style. Uh, I would expect it to be more of the dream reaver style. It has made uh, it has made a resurgence lately. It is, it is a very powerful deck against other control decks. 
However, Scream One, one Two is playing a red deck, which can go aggressive, and it all depends on the early game. If Scream gets the early game, then he can easily win. However, if Teddy manages to hold off the assault of Scream and gets out his Dream Reavers, then it can be a whole different story. Yeah, it's also interesting in this spot, uh, of course, we see these battle toads in Teddy's hand to start off with. Uh, if Scream is able to find another big Garrett in play, even just uh, ground shakers can get a lot of value, you're able to clear off those small creatures from blue very efficiently. Now, once those Archons come down, Teddy's going to swing that advantage back in his favor with the value game, but uh, Scream just in a position where, depending on what he's able to draw into and depending on how much Teddy floods onto the board, he can actually pick up a lot of value. Indeed. Now, Teddy does get the Frogify, which is a great way to deal with the Cypher that might come down, although Scream might have just decided to just play the Underground Brigands. It also deals with uh, one of those toads and gain, uh, gains you even more Feria. So I would actually just go for the Brigand. Don't, don't be greedy. Just Yeah, no need in this situation to play Cypher in a spot where you know your opponent can deal with it so easily and basically just end the game right there. If your Brigand gets cleared by something like Aurora, yeah, that sucks, but it's a 1 in 30 of the deck. If you play Cypher and your opponent frogifies it, able to clear it with the Battle Toad here, it really is difficult to then play another creature down and, and well, have that stick onto the board. The Underground Brigand is just able to do so much more, I think, for well, you. Well, to be fair, don't tell the odds uh, in the in this <laughs> game because, as we've seen, Scream now got the top decks, and perhaps Teddy is now gathering all his power, all his energy. He's reaching for the sun, praising it, for that top deck. Uh, I would expect Scream goes towards, yeah, it looks like that's the way he's gonna go, uh, towards the right, the side that Teddy is a little more developed towards. Uh, generally, you want to stop Blue from collecting, you, you, of course, if it is the style that uses Colossus as their end game win condition. Uh, you definitely want to go f towards protecting that side rather than going away from your opponent but uh, at the same time that means that scream might not be able to get an, an axe grinder position and teddy going for the full reset onto the opposite side going for you want to go that way fine i'm just gonna switch and go this way it just shows off the the extra mobility that blue is able to exert against the red deck indeed now now here we might actually see the cypher come down just because Scream thinks, okay, I, I, he, I need a way to deal with this Archon. Uh, Underground Brigand can deal with it, but that means that he can't move up. Because in that case, he would have to preemptively play the Gift of Steel, which can get frogified. And that would just not put Scream in a gr great position. However, if he plays Cypher uh, right between the wells, he can actually also still threaten the Archon. Gives uh, Teddy the choice of, okay, what well, am I going to uh, frogify the Cypher? Okay, you frogify the Cypher. I'm now going to play my Gift of Steel on the Underground Brigand and trade into the Archon. And also gaining Teferia from it. It's, it's almost like playing a green deck in that situation when you don't want to commit too many resources onto one creature. You really want to spread those buffs out. Just you like you said, if, you, if you're able to play Cypher down, you kind of turn the focus to it for the Frogify, and then you're able to get that Gift of Steel value. He can also just play, decide to play the Underground boss instead and go for that. But I actually prefer this, probably prefer the Cypher here to bait out that Frogify. And... Moving Setting. up with the... I think he's going to have to... Oh, he goes for Cypher in front. I, I... Okay. Yeah, no, he's going for Cypher in front, but I would have preferred it to go uh, next to the uh, next to the Feria so that the Gabriel Archon can't trade in with the Cypher if he frogifies. However, if he decides to trade in with the Cypher, then the Underground Bin, uh, Brigand can finish it off and he can just play a Underground Boss next to the opponent's well. Uh, with the chance of playing a Silent Horse Master to hit the face. Or even kill one of the frogs. It's a situation, I think, where you want to set Cypher up in a decent enough position, whether it's for Horse Master follow-up or just natural movement follow-up, um, instead of just playing scared around the Frogify. Uh, but it's, it's really tough in that situation. Interesting enough, we're going to see Teddy go for just continuing to move off to the left side, not even going for the Frogify play there. Yeah, indeed. And 
he might actually get punished for it as Sire, as we do see that Scream does have to sign the Horse Master and he can just go double land and Horse Master the Cypher and Bay uh, and kill it. And in then even then, yeah, the Frog of Fire will come down and will get killed. But that Cypher got some value. I don't even mind not going for the Horse Master. It's tough to say because Cypher can get value there and you basically force the Frog of Fire out of your opponent, but Cypher actually ends up in a situation where if it use, if Scream uses the Horse Master to kill off one Archon, the other Archon and a Battletoad can easily kill it off, or Frogify and then a Battletoad can kill it off. It puts Cypher in a very indefensible position, uh, just for whatever Scream's follow-up is. Well, so just continuing to push up the right side might not be that actually, bad. Actually, a Gabriel Archon and Toad won't be enough because he did... Don't forget, the Cypher will stay at 6 health. So, yeah, so then the other Archon and the Battle Toad will be able to kill... Oh, never mind. Yeah, no, it'll, because he it'll continue to back. gain each time. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm just being dumb. <laughs> that is okay. We all... We both have our dumb moments. I've had some earlier, so... And we are going to see the Silent Horse Master here. And he's going to move back this Underground Brigand just in case this frog is going to be cheeky and hidden to the orb. Yeah, a little awkward there because of the way that Scream has to position his prairies, uh, has to then move the Brigand back, and then you just kind of end up in an awkward spot. But um, I do like not playing the boss versus playing it here, just because it isn't. it would end up in a position where it doesn't really accomplish anything, and then uh, Scream's saving that Faria for a possible AoE if he draws into one, depending on what Teddy goes for. Indeed, I do like that he doesn't play the boss. He keeps it. The underground boss wouldn't do much there. And right now, if he gets the AoE and perhaps another Cypher's Wrath, he can just nearly kill, uh, clear the board. But sadly, either the Mystic Beast or the Gaming Archon would survive in that case still. Yeah, depending on the movement here coming out from Teddy, uh, maybe Scream resets with a Ground Shaker here or or just the Underground Boss. Um, you've now seen that Frogify come out for your, your opponents, so you're not sure how likely it is they have a second one. So setting up the Ground Shaker, either defensively or aggressively, looks like it should actually gain a lot of value here. Well, I would say that he has to, he has to go for the aggressive uh, aggression because blue generally it has a good time in the later stages of the game especially with the archons now he has already played two archons uh, so he only has one left which we can see in his hand but those archons that even that one archon can give a lot of value and it doesn't seem that teddy has the uh dream reaver deck it is just more of a controller style or mid-range blue deck yeah, I'm very so, interested to see what Teddy's triggers are for these Archons, uh, because we've seen very early cards come out. We've seen Battletoads, we've seen the Archons, and then now a Mystic Beast tends to be more of a well, mid-rangey. Well, I actually know. I actually might know. Um, it's the Colossi. Oh, that would make a lot of sense. Yes, they do. They do trigger from Gaming Archon because the Gaming Archon does say if you've played two cards with a base cost of seven or higher, which yep. the Colossi do have. And Teddy going for a lot of prairies in the early game here as well, instead of developing a lake every single turn, which you really need for those Dream Reavers. So, yeah, it definitely looks like it would be uh, Endgame Colossi instead of uh, something like we used to see, which was like Windfall for the Fairy Gain engine or the Dream Reaver, which has become uh, so popular recently. Now, I didn't keep count, but Teddy has been double collecting for quite some time. He has been collecting from the opponent as well. So those Colossi must have been discounted quite a bit right now yeah he's collected at least probably three or four times so they, they should be getting very close to the minimal cost here uh, we are going to see another archon come down in a good position here from teddy cypher's wrath is a really nice pickup here though that for is, a scream indeed it is because that way he can just kill the mystic beast uh be more a little bit more aggressive with a side and horse master because scream knows he has more aoe in his deck so he doesn't really care if the horse master trades into the archon he actually hopes for it because he'll probably draw into something that can kill off the archon anyways like another ground shaker 
current pace of the game right now, Scream is going to be feeling very lucky to have dealt with all of these Archons before they've triggered up into 6-6s. Six it's bad enough when you have to deal with 4, four Feria 7-7s seven uh, from the Colossi. When you're dealing with 4 Feria 6-6s, six it's just as difficult because they have that extra movement as well. And I would expect actually for Scream to play an underground, uh, the underground boss very aggressively, perhaps even moving up with his Ground Shaker just to put up that threat. And next turn, he can just go play a Gift of Steel on the underground boss, hit the orb, get some more extra area. And yeah, he just needs to be aggressive. Yeah, that looks like a great play, and that is what Scream's going to go for. Saves him exactly the Faria for the Cypher's Wrath here. Uh, I was kind of interested there if Scream was going to go for double Prairies instead, um, just to move Ground Shaker down, give it that attack line, then you have your boss to follow up right after. But Scream going for the play that sets up the boss in a position where it can actually attack the orb next turn, instead of a position where it would have been a turn away, but you already have the land, so maybe you could draw next turn. So... This is going to force Scream to play a land next turn. Uh, he's not going to be able to draw or gain an extra Feria, but sets up what looks like 11 damage, which is going to be massive. Indeed, and not just 11 damage, but also gain an extra two Feria, so he can play an, perhaps another Cypher's Wrath or even a Flame Burst. So Teddy is in a very tough spot. Now, he does have to Frogify, so he can deal with one of these, but the question is, do you want to deal... Do you want to Put it on the underground boss or do you want to put it on ground shaker the ground shaker deals at the moment more damage and if he plays it on the ground shaker he can clear it using his gabriel archon however that underground boss hitting your orb you don't like that especially if scream has a gift of steel in his hand which he does I think the big thing here as well, if Teddy goes for the Frogify on Ground Shaker, the Archon is able to clear it, and then the other Archon in the top left corner is possibly able to clear the Horse Master. Um, that sets you very vulnerable to a Ground Shaker that your opponent is easily going to be able to play next turn. So uh, I, I'm really not sure. It looks like he's going to go for the Frogify, but chooses to move the Archon away instead of keeping it in the aggressive position just because he was so afraid of that AoE threat. Yeah, and now... Yet, uh, now Scream can decide to just play the Gift of Steel, hit uh, build the land, hit the orb, and maybe even play an aggressive Ground Shaker. Um, he can also decide to kill the frog, and to be honest, I would actually just kill that frog, because that way, Scree Teddy can't double collect unless he moves his Gabriel Archon back. Yeah, that Archon actually ends up in a really awkward position for Teddy because he moved it two spaces to be uh, very safe from the Horse Master. It ends up kind of in no man's land, not going to be able to attack the orb next turn if Teddy chooses to go aggressive. If he moves back defensively, it's only one land. You're not taking full advantage of that movement and, and just natural collection. So it does end up in a pretty awkward spot. Uh, Scream, unfortunately, not in a really good follow-up here has the axe grinder has the gift of steel but an aoe would have been absolutely devastating to teddy at this stage of the game indeed but i would say that he's just he should just go for the pressure uh play the gift of steel there's already been two frog fires played oh i really don't like this play coming out from scream here it does play it uh, more passively, just attacking into the battle toad with the underground boss, but you leave your axe grinder so exposed. Th this Archon for Teddy has got so much value. Indeed. However, oh, Teddy gets does get the frog of, uh, gets the frog of ice. So good, actually good thing for Scream that he didn't hit the orb because he would have gotten punished for it. However, right now, yeah. Scream is in a kind of an awkward spot because the Gaming Archon can kill off the X Grinder. He can move his other Archon back and play a Triton Warrior. And that underground boss is just a free free now. And well, it can it can gra grant a lot of value, but it will most likely die another turn the next turn, anyways. That yeah, this sets up a really nice position. Teddy just deciding right now, it looks like, on moving that Archon up aggressively a space or down defensively a space. I think I like moving back down because you've now picked up that Frogify. You almost guarantee that you're going to win the race. He decides to just trade in into the underground boss and play the Triton Warrior to deal with the Axe Grinder, which I actually might like indeed more because now the ex now the underground boss can't get that two uh, feria for free 
Yeah, but Scream's sitting on 11. The two fairy of the underground boss really doesn't matter in the end because you've given it to him with that attack anyway. Uh, in that situation, it looked so nice for Teddy to move over and kill the axe grinder. And then you have your other Archon in a, in a protected position. So the underground boss from Scream, if it is Gift of Steel, attack the orb, you have the Frogify to gain that value back. Of course, we see the Emperor's well, command in Teddy's hand is going to be healing anyway. Well, you say, you're say saying that, but... The Feria in this matchup actually does matter a lot because this this will probably still take a while. So both players are going for the end game, and now, right now, because Scream has so much Feria, he can just draw every turn, and he can just combo his AOEs together to just deal with any board that Teddy builds up. So Scream going for the trade of the Axe Grinder means he's going to go Underground Brigand and set that up into Gift of Steel for next turn. Uh, unfortunately, in that spot, if he had gone for the Axe Grinder hit to the orb, the Brigand would have been very exposed to a good trade um, uh, from the Triton Warrior, and then you end up in a, a little bit of an awkward spot there. But Ooh, ooh the bad draw for Teddy. Tides. Yeah, that is a great draw for Teddy, because now he can just get rid of get rid of this underground uh, brigand he can even collect uh, extra time and make sure that the gift of steel is kind of dead right now yeah that actually does end up being quite a bit better i thought that was actually a really bad yeah, job for teddy spinner. coming out just because you really want a colossus you want to exert pressure there but these spitters are actually paying off massively for Scream in this matchup. Indeed, I, I think this is a situation where you just horse master just to get another creature on board, even though you don't necessarily need it for its effect here. Oh, most definitely. You just because one thing that Blue is bad at is just clearing off a board when it doesn't have a board of its own. It needs it generally needs a board. The only thing that can maybe do it are the um, are the ninja toads, but. I haven't seen that from Teddy yet, so they might not even run those. Yeah, definitely not really looking like that's a card that Teddy has in this deck here. I, I really hope Scream plays the Horse Master, otherwise you're really relying on whatever you top deck of uh, an AoE or something big next turn. Horse Master just represents uh, so much more safety for this Flame Spitter. And Indeed. just pushing damage. Like you're in a position where your opponent has no creatures on the board and you really have control. And he actually, if he plays the Horse Master aggressively, he can actually deal 11 damage next turn. He does play defensively, however. I would have actually preferred it if he maybe did play it aggressively uh, with those uh, Gift of Steels uh, for the next turn. Just nuke that face. Because Teddy has no board right now. He can play the Water Elemental, but that Water Elemental is going to be in an awkward spot. Yeah, and one of the big things uh, I kind of mentioned in the previous games when Teddy was on the red deck as well, Really, you have three Flame Bursts. You have Cypher's Wrath that's going to uh, deal damage to your opponent. You have these Ground Shakers, that, although it's just one damage to the orb, it does burn them down. So really, your opponent's life total is restricted on, you know, the, if you get those hits in with the creatures, you can draw into the Flame Burst to end the game. Uh, in this situation, Scream could have pushed so much damage with the Horse Master, where that extra one Feria from playing it as a defensive collector really doesn't make that much of a difference. Indeed, um, and he can now also play the Ground Shaker, and in that case, that would have represented so much damage uh, and represented lethal actually next turn if he did that. But he did opt in to go more for the for the greedier. Uh, well, I would say greedier for the more collecting long game, and it could actually bite him in the ass because here comes Beiru. Yeah, Beiru is a really big pickup here, not only for the power of the creature, the body itself, but just because it's going to clear these mountains off. So Scream's going to have to decide whether he deals with that or whether he just tries to end the game next turn. Well, he can deal with it by just playing a Garadon and a Gift of Steel on the Ground Shaker and clear off the Beiru, have a Garadon, uh, Garadon in a good offensive position. I think he is going to do that. Just clear off this Beiru, make it... Oh, he doesn't even... Well, yeah, no, he is going to play the Garudon, never mind. <laughs> yeah, playing the Garudon, moving up with his Flame Spitter to hit that face, and now... What can Teddy do? He has Emperor's Commands in his hand, but that's only going to delay it. 
Yeah, that looks like it's going to be game here for Scream. Uh, of course, could have just oh! pushed all of that damage to the orb, but the Garadin coming down, Teddy kind of sees wow. the writing on the wall. We get Scream 112, as Aquablad <laughs> mentioned, my streaming mate from uh, Metagaming TV, takes the series over Teddy. Absolutely Who ever expected brilliant. This? And not just that, but with his first deck as a neck, uh, as a neck, a net meme <laughs> deck. Amazing, oh, amazing series. Brilliant oh. play coming out. Uh, I, I wonder what call, what the uh, desk has to say. Absolutely, as, take so it away, let's guys. It let's them. hear it. Wow, so that was uh, that was a surprise, a very pleasant surprise, I might add. Scream, but defeating a monthly cup champion in the first round of this monthly cup. What do you even say about this, Cappuccino? What a surprise showing. I'm flabbergasted. That was amazing. Scream, you know, kind of the underdog, right? He hadn't played in very month. Uh, he hadn't played in many monthlies. I think this was his first one, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So for him to just show up and take down Teddy, who had been having phenomenal plays um, in previous monthly cups and winning one, just... I'm completely shocked that it was such an upset in that manner. Yeah, and to be fair, you know, Scream had some great lines of play during his games. Um, there were a few which uh, we were talking about, um, you and Zologrim and myself, um, where things could have been done a bit, a little bit differently, but he got the result. You know, he, he beat Teddy, he beat a monthly cup champion round one. So massive congratulations to Scream there. Uh, that was fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Um... I, I do think there was, as you pointed out, a few things that could have been done differently. When we saw, for instance, um, Scream go up the opposite side of Teddy in the red first red match, he could have instead opted to play a more defensive route and developing both bosses on each side of his orb and just try and stall out the game. Uh, it was pretty fortunate for Teddy to find all three Axe Grinders, though, because he managed to just snowball that effect of getting those 5-4 bodies later on. But... Yeah, Stream ended up pulling it off, and a uh, huge um, accomplishment for him. And those Nats as well in the first game. <laughs> we were saying, oh, he's just memeing here, but then he won, and then he continued to win after. It was absolutely fantastic. Well done to Scream. Unfortunate for Teddy. I know he is a, uh, a crowd favorite to take one of these big cups, but now Scream, maybe he will be our next monthly cup champion. Who knows? Yeah, it's actually great that you point out the Nat deck because I was looking at that and it had a lot of key things about it that is just very hard for opponents to deal with. If you can get that Nat out early and have decent summoning positions, which we saw very often he was getting the summons in the spots he needed, and then you find, you know, that golden aviary and you start getting three damage every hit, you know, there was a reason that Nat was nerfed from two damage down to one. It's just so oppressive when you can get multiple hits in with it. Now, I, I've played a fair amount of Nats myself. Uh, did a deck doctor on it uh, a few weeks ago. So if you would like to get know more about the Nat decks, be sure to check that on our uh, YouTube channel. But it's it's one of those decks that if it gets going, it's really hard to stop. It, it, because they will you will always have creatures on board, especially for a say for a deck like Blue. Uh, which needs initiative to be proactive. If you have a Nat deck against, like, Blue Jump, you're very favored to win that because if you ever get a Nat or two down and they stick with an Avery and they can start clearing stuff, it's very hard for, say, a Blue Jump to come back from that because they'll never gain initiative ever again. So it does have good matchups against some of the Tier 1 decks. Uh, but overall, I think it's just fun. You know, it's just a fun deck. You get to use your Nats, you get to use Averys, you just get to use cool mobility tricks. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see how that evolves over time uh, as Feria grows as a game. Definitely. And, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit sad I didn't get to see my favorite deck, the Yellow Events, but he made up for it with the Yellow Flyers. I like that. Right, before we go into anything else, I'd like us to take a quick look at the bracket. And we didn't do this at the start. Uh, some matches have gone on and uh, moved on to round two. Uh, but at a base level, we can kind of have a, an idea of how the tournament's going to play out. Now, in the top left-hand corner, man, there that is stacked. <laughs> Mayhem, Dompok, 
Alvar, King Dan's, S of Dawn, Aether Llama, Little Newbie, and Loctar. Like, that's that's a pretty stacked top corner there. Yeah, definitely a lot of very strong players. Um, actually, all throughout, it looks like those strong players split pretty well between. Like, the top right corner also looks very strong, but... Um, yeah, I mean, in particular, when you have Mayhem, you have King Dance, you have a bunch of those other names, as you pointed out. Some really strong players in that top left corner. Yeah, and we have plenty of matches coming your way. But before we move on, let me just check up on something. Um, is there any any thoughts on either player's lineups? Do you think uh, any of their decks were kind of weak? for this tournament or I mean the Nat deck was the surprise of course but I'm talking about like any other decks you felt were weak or any decks you felt that were really strong well I think as an underdog player honestly playing stuff that your opponent doesn't expect is going to be a huge um, advantage for you because you get to maybe catch them off guard maybe get a strain of luck whereas when you're playing a standard deck it's very easy for your opponent to understand the matchup so if they're a very experienced player they know where to weave in value so I, I think Scream bringing these, you know, sort of atypical decks um, was actually a very strong idea. But from Teddy, I am surprised we didn't get to see Yellow Events. I actually think that's the strongest deck in the meta at the moment. But, you know, his red combat, very strong. Um, going through, I don't know if the Outland Rangers were strong in it. That's maybe a weakness against Yellow and Red. Um, and then... Honestly, the rest of his decks were okay. I think blue is his weakest one. And instead of the blue deck, I think I would have preferred to see uh, a yellow event deck. But from Scream, I liked his decks. Yeah, yellow events is interesting. I, I was actually talking to Heavy about yellow events. And I kind of feel like yellow events is... Out of the top, out of the tier one decks, we have Crackthorn, we have Blue Jump, and we have yellow events. I, I would say like... They've been tier one for a little while now, but Yellow Events is kind of the wild card of those because you could have a crazy good hand and just win the game and it's just nothing your opponent can do, but you can also just draw a hand of events and then you can't do anything and then you lose the game. So I feel like it's it's has so much potential to snowball, but it has so much potential to backfire as well, just, just because of the nature of the deck. Well, it does depend on the list. Um, you're definitely right. Some people usually go for a more event line where they use like hold hold the line and stuff, but um, the list that I've sort of popularized on my stream back when I used to play it very often, it's actually more favored to have creatures than majority of decks. Like a lot of decks actually have more events than the version of yellow events I would even play. Uh, using like soul packs and um, windstorm colossus, even if you have that event heavy hand, you can still get out your big creatures early on, and that's one of the main advantages. Now you can sometimes get flashman, flashman, falcon dive that happens but you know it's the same thing for red with like getting double flame burst cypher's wrath yeah you can every deck is kind of prone to that i i just feel like like you said some builds of yellow events uh is even more prone to that based on how many events they decide to include in the overall list but now guys we have something very special for you we are going to reveal the first spoiler for the Oversky expansion here exclusively at this monthly cup I hope you guys are excited. We're going to have Atmaz to talk you through it. Atmaz, are you with us? I'm here. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, Tell us you, about this can card. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Well, okay. So this is what everyone's waiting for. We are going to reveal some new cards on stream today for the Oversky that's coming out this summer. This will be the very first card um, that we've publicly revealed. Um, so... To, to introduce this a little bit, uh, there's a lot of themes uh, we're aiming for in the Oversky, and, and one of them, uh, an important one, is discovery, right? Uh, the Oversky is up in the air. It's an unknown land. No one's seen it before. Well, a lot of people haven't seen it before, so uh, we're going need to need to explore uh, this land, discover it. That's, that's an important theme um, in the Oversky. So this first card we have, I don't know if you have it on stream already, is called the Intrepid Explorer. Now, the text of the card, of course, reads uh, gift. Uh, each player will get an explore card. Um, but that's not perhaps the most interesting about this card. If you'll notice in the upper left of the land requirement, there's something strange there. Um, it's not a typical 
land requirement. It almost looks like a little rainbow. Well, what this is called is a wild land. Now, um, a wild land might be what you already expect it to be. A wild land means that you just you just need any special land of any color in order to play this card. So mountain, forest, desert, lake, any one. Any one of those four, and you can play, for example, this card that has a one wild land requirement. Wild lands are going to be majorly featured in the Oversky expansion, which also, in addition to uh, the, th the themes of discovery and exploration, we're going to be pushing multicolor, more tools for multicolor decks. We think multicolor decks are some of the most interesting in Feria because you can share card pools between different colors. You're not limited uh, to one color. You know, just by default, putting two colors in your deck, your options grow exponentially. So we want to introduce wild lands to help that out and make uh, for a lot of interesting decks. Now, to be specific about wild lands, um, you don't, uh, for example, let's say a card costs two mountains and one wild land. It's important to note, you will still need two mountains and then one of any special color. So one of those mountains doesn't also satisfy uh, the requirement of that wild land, just to make that clear. So you will still need three uh, lands uh, appropriately for, for a card like that. But this is Intrepid Explorer. These are wild lands. This is the first card of Oversky. Uh, I'd like to hear what our, what our desk thinks about this card. All right, Cavatune, any, any thoughts? I want to pick your brain here. Wow. Okay, so I have a lot of ideas on this card. First of all, blue-yellow event. Very popular deck. Everyone knows it as an event deck. This is adding another event to your list. So those Disciples, those Chargers, Synergy there, uh, Archers, you know, having that Explore card, especially for that deck, is huge because it lets you flashwind your Archers, maneuver your Archers a bit better because you have more land to step on. And it's a 3-3 body for 3, so right there it's just solid. It's a solid body. But then even going more into like just mono-yellow event decks where you can get that Windstorm Colossus having that event, or Red Rush decks where you can get the aggressive Axe Grinder, definitely a lot of theory crafting that can go with this card. It's interesting because given, you know, giving yourself additional lands... And a free free body is very powerful, like you said, for any deck that either wants to apply pressure quickly or wants event synergy. And blue yellow events, one of my favorite decks of all time. It's great to see that get another tool because sometimes with blue yellow events, you, you're so focused on building special land, it can actually make your land develop a bit clunky, uh, depending on how you what you run in your list. And being able to so with blue yellow events you tend to go like desert desert lake to a well and then you have a lake and then you have that gap and then you could fill that gap with the explore and then put a lake on your opponent's well or a desert and then you have an aggressive avenue for your disciples and your charges uh, without say needing maybe a flash wind uh, maybe just needing kaleem's trainer so it does definitely open up um, some more tools for these event synergy decks uh, i think it looks really cool is there anyone else on the casting team would like to have a comment on this and any thoughts scorch sure i'll jump in uh even just without looking at this card specifically just the mechanic of the wild land requirement that atmas was talking about absolutely love to see that come in uh it, it's something that is so cool to see especially like he said there will be something like mountain and wild requirement it just leads towards those dual color decks i think it looks incredibly interesting for monthly cup lineups uh it'll be very interesting after over sky comes out to see what players decide to go for in uh the monthly cups but for this card specifically like you guys are talking about i absolutely love it when you're in those dual color car or uh decks like the blue yellow events you need that extra land development for your creatures because a lot of them do have the extra movement you're able to put that explorer in there uh now it does have the bit of the downside of your opponent gets an explorer as well so um it almost looks a little underpowered to me of, of a three fairy a three three when you ha do have that duel of a benefit to you but a benefit to your, your opponent as well Awesome, thank you very much, Scott. Zolo Grim, nice to have you back with us. Uh, I didn't get to see you last month, but he's made his return. Uh, what do you think of this card? Hey, Aqua, hey all. Thank you for having me back. I'm very excited to be casting a monthly again. 
uh, but we're talking about this exciting new card now, and I I would like to present a bit of a counterpoint to what Scott just said in uh, it being what seems at first glance to be a very fair card because it gives an explore to you, but it also gives an explore to your opponent. So it seems like it would be a roughly equal. Uh, I don't think that's really the case because um, what you have to keep in mind is that you can control when you play this card. So you have absolute control over when you want to use this explore. And I think that's a huge advantage because first of all, it's an event and you know you have this card in your deck. So you can build an event focused deck and there's a very good chance that your opponent might not play any kind of event synergies in this deck. So that's an inherent advantage, first of all. But second of all, you are the first person to be able to use the Explore, so you get a farrier advantage to put pressure on the board. Being the proactive player is always an advantage because your opponent has to react and you already have your creatures or your removal or whatever available at your disposal. And also, you are the first to be able to use the additional land to surprise the opponent, like you already mentioned, with uh, uh, movement tricks and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of hidden depth. Uh, kind of to the card, which seems uh, like it would be fair at first glance, but I think that's very, uh, there's a lot of chances for the card to give you a big advantage that's not very obvious when you just look at it for the first time. That's actually a really good point, yeah, and another thing as well is if you're playing second, you could potentially get two explorers, think of that, <laughs> that's going to be crazy. But having control of when your opponent gets access to their explore is, a, like I said, a huge advantage because, like I said, having an initiative, uh, being able to use that explore first the way you want to use it and forcing your opponent to maybe use theirs in a more counter style is always great in card games you always want to be the initiator for these kind of cards but yeah it, it seems really cool I'm, I'm very excited for it any any other thoughts from the casters um i mean we've got a bit of time so i don't mind discussing this a bit more in depth yeah looking at this actually just riding off of the point that um that he had just made if you're dropping like a charger and you have a flashman in hand Next turn you drop this, you double and you get the explore, and then you use the flashman. Like there's so much more reach potential you have in a yellow event deck in particular with this card because you get to use the event the turn you play it, get the trade, and then even if your opponent gets the event card, you got more value out of it because you denied his collector. And so you're gonna start seeing a lot of value coming down from these explorers the turn that the intrepids played and definitely a lot of potential that this card can have. It can it accelerates your land as well. That's another thing. Not only do you gain additional fear, not only do you get an event to use your event synergy, being able to push your land further towards your opponent, especially if you're playing a kind of an aggressive mid-range deck, is very valuable because this can give you access to Axe Grinder spots quickly, uh, Mystic Beast spots quickly. So there, uh, there are plenty of things you can do with this card. Now we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there for that card. That is the ex new explorer coming out in the Oversky, and we'll have more reveals for you guys throughout the tournament. Now we're gonna go to a quick break while we set up the next match. But I think Atmos wants to say something before we do. Yes, Nick. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for letting me interrupt. I do want to preface: uh, we are going to show more cards today. Um, but it's important to note that the numbers, the specific numbers of the cards are subject to change. You can expect the designs to remain the same uh, and, and all that. But, you know, we are going to test these cards internally to make sure we don't release anything too crazy. Um, but, of course, we're going to make sure they're fun. So if, if numbers are, get tweaked a little bit before you see this card out in the wild, uh, no pun intended, um, don't be surprised. Uh, we hope you enjoy uh, the new Wildland concept that's what we want to introduce with this card to you, um, you know, a very, uh, a, a very basic as you can get wild card. Well, not even that, but just a very simple wildland card example. We have more to show you throughout the rest of the stream. Uh, I believe we'll be doing it before the semifinals, then third place, then finally the grand final. So stick around, and you'll see plenty more cards, and of course, plenty more games. And uh, thanks a lot. All righty, so let's go to a break. We'll set up the next match for you guys, and we will be back very shortly. Don't go anywhere.